Happy Wednesday, everybody. I am Joe Marcello, joined as always by my partners in comic book crime, Orrin Phillips. Hey, everybody. And Mike Farah. Howdy, folks. We are the Dollar Bin Bandits, and this is the Dollar Bin Bandits podcast. And today is our third episode in our season of Superman series. Uh, and today we are proud to bring to you our interview with a man that certainly means a lot to us and to me as both a comic book collector and obviously as a Superman fan. Uh, we're talking about none other than Dan Jurgens. Now, Dan has been, uh, you know, he's he means a lot to a lot of people uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, he has touched on and worked on so many characters and so many memorable story arcs. Uh, he is instrumental in creating Cyborg Superman, as well as bringing you the monster doomsday, uh, the monster who killed Superman. Uh, but what sticks out to me, uh, probably most memorably, is the fact that he is one of a few comic book uh, artists and creators that I remembered their names. I took the time out of my reading to actually learn their name and who this person was. Because up until that point, I would just read and move on. Uh, but, you know, his work, his writing, his art really stuck with me so much that I really need to know who this person was. Yeah, when we first started this uh, project of Dollar Bin Bandits, uh, Mr. Jurgens was on our very short list. And when we got the green light from him, uh, we were all so, so excited. Couldn't wait for the day to come. And it definitely lit up the expectations. A wonderful guy, uh, very honest answers, great insight, and just... You know, you, you hope people are as wonderful as you think they are. And this is an example where it lived up to the case. I don't have anything bad to say about uh, Dan Jurgens. He was my introduction to comics. Uh, the first comic I ever bought was one of his, I don't remember if it was Adventures of Superman or Action Comics, um, but it was the uh, Curse of the Crimson Kryptonite storyline. And he was one of the people that hooked me on comics. So just like Joe and Oren, really just a foundational creator in all of our lives. And um, we'd like to share that interview with you and, uh, you know, have you uh, share with us, you know, in the nostalgia of talking to one of our favorite creators. So this is Dan Jurgens. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm happy to be here, guys. Um, as you could tell, we are thrilled to have you. Um, so I'm going to ask you, uh, same question we ask all of our guests, we start at the beginning. Um, how did you get into comics? Uh, how did I get into them as a reader or how did I get in as a pro? Well, either or they well, may, so, they may, they may bridge one another. So well, not quite that, but so, um, I'm of the age that, uh, when I was a kid, like seven years old, you know, the live action Adam West Batman TV series, <clears throat> excuse me, was on the air, you know, in prime time. We're not talking after school reruns yet. And that's how I first became aware of, you know, the idea of superheroes and Batman. I mean, I had this kind of a dim awareness of Superman and probably Batman as well, but that was really the first exposure. And that's what drew me in. And then one summer night, I was you know, out walking through the neighborhood. And I saw a couple of kids who were older than I was sitting on their front step and they had these stacks of four color pamphlets. Right. And I said, what are you guys doing? And then I looked and they had what I then came to realize were comic books. And in that stack, they had Batman comic books. So all of a sudden I could see, so this is where Batman came from. Right. And, uh, one of them even had the, um, 25 cent giant, which was, um, you know, Robin dies at dawn was reprinted in the story. And, and I remember seeing that and saying, Robin's dead. Holy shit. That can't be, can it? So, you know, I had to pick it up and look at it. And all I remember is looking through all these comics and um, many of them had, because the guys were older than me, had come out a few years prior to that. Uh, I remember seeing some very early Marvels and everything. And most of all, I remember going home and saying to my mom, can we go downtown to the drugstore so I can buy some comics? So that's that's where it started. It's, uh, it's very similar to a lot of us, I have to say. Now, one question for you. Do you still have those? Um, 
I, I have like, uh, you know, and, and none of those were mine. The, the first couple of comics I bought, I did not hold on to, uh, unfortunately. And uh, I've had to go back and since reacquire them. But uh, yeah, you know, at, at some point when you're a kid, it seems like comics just sort of disappear from your bedroom. Yeah. You know, and that, that was my story. And then uh, eventually I came around and I said, okay, at this age, now I'm, I'm going to start buying these and making sure they don't disappear. So uh, I may not have that initial couple of waves, but I have things from after that. Yes. Yeah. I think everyone, you know, we just had this discussion recently with, with uh, our last guest is that everyone goes to that same period. You have comics, you discover them. You're like, wow, these are amazing. And then there's a, like a, you know, a dark period where they go away. And mm-hmm. then you, you have this rebirth of, you know, interest and you're like, well, I have to get those specific comics back again. Oh, and yeah. at some point, you know, through whatever, you know, avenue you may have available to you, you get them again. And then you yeah, come well, to realize you're like, wow, they, at least in my case, I come to discover those comics again. I'm like, you know, they really weren't that pivotal in the comics world, but they were the first for me. So, you know. Yeah. And, you know, they, they, you can say they weren't that pivotal in the world, but in terms of your world and right. opening up doors and and sucking you in and saying, this is this whole other thing that's out there and it's full of uh, color and action and adventure and excitement and everything like that. It's amazing how we r- look back on those and realize it's a pretty profound experience. So yeah, and I, I still remember those things to this day. What was it that drew you to comics professionally? Uh, I think it was the fusion of art and story. And and what I've always known, even from a very young age, is that I could draw. And and part of drawing is telling a story, even for artists who have no interest in writing the story. So, you know, if if, um, I draw a character that's, you know, just a single character, guy in a business suit, say, and he's on a blank sheet of paper, there you see the figure. But let's say I draw the shadow at his feet that his body cast. Well, that starts to tell a little bit of the story. Where is the sun? Where is the light that is casting that shadow? Is it night? Is it day? You know, it starts to give you clues that there is something else beyond what you're seeing in the picture itself. And, mm-hmm. and I think what I was always attracted to was this idea of uh, art story combined uh as something that i could do that you know even as a you know fifth or sixth grade kid i could sit there and and draw my own little comic stories with my own little word balloons and dialogue and things like that in them and so even from the start i didn't get into comics to be just an artist i didn't you know pursue comics to be just a writer i've always been um interested in it as a storyteller and that fusion of word and image that is so unique to comics. Fantastic. Um, I, uh, you know what? I'm gonna. I'll wait. I'm gonna organize my thoughts accordingly. Orrin, go right ahead. I'm sorry. I was gonna say because when you got to DC, you worked with a number of uh, really big name folks: uh, Jerry Conway, Roy Thomas, and especially Mike Grell. And Mike Grell, like yourself, artist and and writer. How much did that influence you working with, with someone like him? Well, it did a lot. And, and I think part of it is it, it wasn't just, you know, what I was doing at D.C. at the time. It's also sort of what was happening, happening in the industry at that time. So, you know, it, it wasn't long after that or actually it would have been before I started, I think, that um, John Byrne, who had been working with Chris Claremont on X-Men, said, I'm going to start to write more of my stuff and was doing so I believe on Fantastic Four at that point, Alpha Flight, you had Frank doing, the, uh, Frank Miller doing the stuff he was doing on Daredevil. Um, it wasn't long after that, that you would have first comics happen where you had uh, Howard Chaikin doing American Flag as well as, you know, Mike doing John Sable. So there, there was sort of, the, oh, and another profound influence was everything Jim Starlin had been doing at Marvel as a writer artist with Captain Marvel and then Adam Warlock. And so what I was seeing is this true viability that 
at Marvel and DC, you could write and draw your own material. And it was something that, you know, I'd only been in the door at DC a few months as an artist when I'd say, you know, I want to write. And, and so, you know, eventually um, I was able to make that happen. And I think able to prove that, yeah, I could. Most definitely. Did you ever think to do um, sort of an independent book at the time too, to, to do some work at first or one of those companies to sort of sharpen your writing skills or were you content with working with DC at the time? You know, it's, it's um, weird because it, it's sort of like opportunity is everything. And if, when that isn't timing certainly is. Mm -hmm. So if, if I were to go back to that time, um, you know, the idea of doing your character and owning it was still a pretty dim concept that, that was out there. And so uh, say we're talking like uh, 84, some, 1984, somewhere in there, when I started to put together the, the idea of Booster Gold and where I might do it, uh, it, it just sort of became the situation where I ended up doing it at DC because I didn't perceive there being a lot of other opportunities and outlets to do it. And so I was, you know, and I was perfectly content to do it at DC as well. I was um, able to make it part of the DC universe and have all sorts of fun with it. So that for me at that time was certainly the right answer because as I said, there weren't a lot of other options. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Booster Gold because I was going to ask you about that next because that has become um, just an absolute favorite character of mine. I mean, it's he's he is a fun character in every sense of the word uh you know what was what was the inspiration to create that character and did you foresee that character becoming kind of this man behind the curtain that he's become recently well, okay, so once again if we go back to say 1984 and 85 there's no way to foresee what it would be three decades later you know right well but, uh uh or more than three decades really or you know but i think so if we go back to that time what was the world like and at that time in um there was uh the olympics in 1984 uh there were these strict rules about what athletes could do before the olympics during the olympics etc cetera, etc cetera, in, in terms of product endorsement and while watching it um you know, one of the announcers had mentioned that uh, one of the athletes had or was, or was on the verge of having this big endorsement deal once he got done and had all his medals and everything. And in that moment, I, I sort of had this idea about, well, why wouldn't a superhero do that same thing? Which is not to say um, have to find extreme fortune but to still do the product endorsement thing. Athletes did it, actors did it, actresses did it. it. It's what people were starting to do. And at the same time, it was this moment where celebrity culture was being uh, becoming something more. You know, People Magazine had only been around a couple of years. Uh, I think Entertainment Tonight had just started up around that time. And so this idea of um, people appearing on magazine covers that weren't just trade magazines, like say, you know, Hollywood, whatever, um, was getting to be more pronounced. So I said, okay, let's have a hero uh, who is here to take part in that same sort of thing. He will promote himself. He will build himself up in the eyes of the public. Uh, and, and he will do product endorsements, et cetera, et cetera, and all that other stuff. Yes, he'll still try and be a hero. I always, uh, when I first pitched it to DC, I said, I kept saying he is not a hero for hire. You know, he's, he's out there having fun with the game, but, but he makes his money doing something else. Uh, and that is promoting his good deeds, I suppose. And, you know, so the time was right for it. And I think part of what amazes me now is, as right as that time was, I think right now is even more timely for a character like Booster Gold. I mean, I think with everything that social media has become and the way he would be able to capitalize on that, um, that Booster Gold is as timely as he ever could be. Uh, as Skeets is also just the, yes. the coolest thing in the world. 
<laughs> well, yeah, and, and part of it is, you know, one of the things you find out as a writer, um, if you're going to do a hero alone, you end up with that sort of internal monologue type of yeah. approach. Yep. And I didn't want to do that because I wanted something, or I wanted a character who was a little lighter and a little bouncier. Well, how do you convey that? You convey it through dialogue. How do you do the dialogue? They've got to have a partner. They've got to have a sidekick. So that's where Skeets came from. And also this idea that because Booster was making up for his mistakes, I needed Jiminy Cricket. And that's really I, what Skeets was. I was just going to say that. Actually, yeah. he was the, his Jiminy Cricket in that sense. Yeah, um, I mean, if you look at it, it's so easy to see. Skeets is Jiminy Cricket. Booster is Pinocchio. Pinocchio wanted to be a boy. Booster wanted to be a hero. So there you go. Mysteries of the universe explained. <laughs> <laughs> he just needs to sing and dance and do all that whole thing. Too. Yeah. Um, did you, uh, and I, you know, and this goes back to, I guess, the character creation, you know, when you create their backstory for someone like, say, Booster Gold, do you kind of plan out their, maybe their long-term story arc in the sense that, okay, we understand where he's coming from at this point but you know what he ultimately will become at some point down the road uh, i only ask because like he you know the character has evolved from more than just the the guy trying to promote himself via you know ads and and right. not um he is i mean he's one of the linear men uh yeah. you know quite frankly through various incarnations which is just awesome you know they, you know, he's, he has wanted to become a hero uh, and wanted that recognition, but unfortunately no one knows with the exception, I think Batman uh, of who he really has become or will become. Um, was that ever factored in? Did you ever want that for him? Yes. Uh, so if you, you know, because he came from the future, there was always this idea that there was going to be a um, atmosphere of time travel behind him i always knew that if he came from the future with stolen items that someone would come and hunt him down right and all of which we did uh in the first two years of the series but you know booster gold volume one ended with number 25 and in the last few pages i made it very clear that booster was unaware of his future and a very and, and a very important future that was waiting for him and i think the last two or three pages there are a couple of captions that indicate that he will become incredibly important to the DC universe. Mm -hmm. um, so that was always the intent. Now it didn't mean it was actually going to work out that way, but at that time, um, that's what we tried to set up. You know, Joe and I, and a lot of fans, you know, we love the artwork and we love the writing. And I'm wondering because you're so successful at both, were you always confident in your ability to do both? Or was there a certain point in your career where you finally felt like, okay, I, I know I can do this. Like I've made the right choice. I, I'm confident with my skills. No, I was not always supremely confident. I thought I could, <laughs> but knowing you can and thinking you can really are two entirely different things. And, you know, to this day, um, people will bring me an early issue that I drew or an earlier issue that I wrote or both. And I'll just look at it and go, yeah, okay, learning on the job for everybody to see, right? But um, I, I think what I had was some pretty good instincts about how to do it. But yeah, like all of us in this business, there are some people who are fortunate enough to hit their stride in the like the first six issues of whatever they do. For the rest of us mere mortals, it takes a little longer. And, and I think some of those mistakes are there. But what I always look for um, when I look at new talent is, you know, what is the spark? What, you know, because if you really look at it, what, what is the thing that works that you can see them building on? What is, with writers, it's what is the idea? What is the approach? And what is it that they're trying to say? And I do think that was there for me. Um, but, I, you know, I've always told people, if, you know, five years after I launched Booster Gold, I had the chance to do it all over again, it would have been a much better series, you know, the first 12 issues. Uh, but that's not life. I mean, like I said, we, I was young, we were all that way. And generally, our mistakes are there to be seen. 
but it, what you just said about booster, booster gold does that always sort of stick with you that thought of uh what if i adjust or if i adjust those things or are you able to clean slate each project and just keep moving on no i'm able to to clean slate because i i think there comes a point where you can say as a creator i know how to make a comic book i know how to make a good comic book uh, I, I know how to make something work if I'm drawing it. I know how to make something work if I'm writing it. That doesn't mean I'm not going to blow it and make a couple of mistakes, but there does come that point where you know what you're doing. And this has happened to me as a writer where I will set up a scene or a sequence and the artist might say to me, no one can draw that. You, that can't be drawn. And I'll say, oh, yes, it can. And I'll, you know, I'll rough it out on a page and say, here's how. So I, I think there comes that point where because you've done it so many times and part of doing it so many times is making so many mistakes that you then get past that curve and, and you're, you're on this um, kind of a glide path where you know how to make it work. Makes sense. Um. I am going to address Death of Superman, <laughs> just because I really want to get to that. Sure. Um, so this was, for me, and I think a lot of people, a major jumping on point. Uh, this was the event that got me into comics initially. Uh, and I just, I read these, you know, it was a, a novelization, actually, of the comic. And then I, I loved it so much. I'm like, wow, this must be even better with pictures. So then I got a, you know, a trade and read that to death till it fell apart. Um, when you and the rest of the creative team were coming up with this, did you foresee it being such a, just a, a beast of a story in that Obviously, I know, you know, everyone has heard about, you know, we lived through obviously being a media frenzy at the time in terms of Superman's going to die and, and et cetera. But did you foresee it being so big? I mean, it really was just an absolutely pivotal moment in comics because, I, you know, characters have died previously. And I think even Superman mm -hmm. died ages ago um, and, and come back, obviously. But this was this was significant character wasn't in the his own comic for a year so it was it was a big deal it was no we couldn't have foreseen it nor did we foresee it that you know we knew when we uh started to put the story together um that that, that it was something that would get a little bit of extra attention now by extra attention what we were hoping for is yeah we'll make the distributor covers right because at that time there were three distributors and maybe we'll get covers on one, two, or all three of them, something like that, uh, which would boost sales 30, 40%, maybe, you know, something along those lines. And, and part of that too is because we knew we had a good story and, and we were having a lot of fun with it. But there was no way we could have foreseen it becoming um, what it did with, you know, uh, making all the major networks in terms of news stories, as well as the morning talk shows every radio station around, virtually every newspaper, uh, that there were lines at every single comic book store across the country as people went in to buy it, you know, things like that. There is no way you could ever foresee anything like that. And, and I think for those of us who remember it, um, we're very, very fortunate to be able to remember it because if I try and describe that now to people who weren't there, you know, they just, you can talk about it and you can describe it a little bit, but they can't grasp it. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was really quite an amazing experience. I mean, I don't think we've seen anything like that since. I mean, obviously comics come out that are uh, media worthy and pivotal moments in terms of uh, their influence on pop culture and et cetera, but nothing has really matched that, I don't think, since. I, I don't think I don't think anything could match that. Um, you know, even when we did the DC Marvel crossover a few years later, uh, which got an awful lot of notice and press, and it jazzed people up within the market and everything, that didn't get that kind of notice. And so I really, um, I, I don't think I can't think of anything that really would do that again. Um, when you were creating the characters of say doomsday and the cyborg um were 
the versions that we saw, I was always curious, were, were there alternate versions that would have, that you may have, would have preferred to have seen in terms of design wise? Well, so let, let me sidestep that just a little bit and then, sure. and this will answer that. So yep. when, when uh, we had our meeting where we came up with the death of Superman, I walked in, I had a yellow legal pad written down on it because I had two ideas. One was death of Superman and the other one written right underneath it was monster destroys Metropolis. Those were not the same idea. They weren't fused at all. I, I, for the monster, I just said, I want to do a story that just is a knockdown, drag out fight that takes apart all of Metropolis. That um, up till then with Superman, one of the problems I had with it was he had so many villains that were essentially like normal people. Lex Luthor was a businessman. Um, Toy Man was essentially just a guy in a suit. Uh, Prankster was a guy in a suit. We had Mr. Z was a guy in a suit. And I wanted to draw a fight scene. And I kept talking about wanting to draw a fight scene that only Superman could have, that it would go on and on and just be this total knockdown drag out fight that would test him in a way that he hadn't been tested. Had nothing to do with the death of Superman at that point. When we first talked about the death of Superman, it was, well, would, who would do it? Would it be Brainiac, Lex Luthor? You know, who exactly would be the bad guy? And we kind of arrived at this idea of fusing those two concepts that what if it was somebody new and, and what if it was this monster that Jurgens is talking about? And I, on the pad, I quick sketched out uh, a rough of doomsday. And I, if people want to go to my website, danjurgens.com, it's posted there. Uh, and it's on that same yellow legal pad paper. It's just this rough of doomsday that had more hair and, but he still had like the elbow, protrude, the, bone, the bony protrusions from the elbow, things like that. So once we decided, and I'm sorry, this is way too long an answer for an easy question. No, no. But, but once we decided that the death of Superman would revolve around a monstrous villain, my initial step of do, sketch of Doomsday is still very much what it ended up being. I think um, in the initial sketch, I also had like a couple of metal plates attached to him, like he was a combination of things. We quickly did away with that and just went with the bone and a sort of exterior weapons and protection with the bones over the eyes. But it was very much as I conceived it. I, I wanna ask you, uh, this is more of a, a personal question. No, I shouldn't say personal, anyway. Um, your opinion of Doomsday now, uh, as it pertains to recent uh, versions of him, do you think he's kind of watered down? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, and, and part of it is, uh, so we were uh, about a year ago, you know, we had been working on the uh, Generations Shattered and Generations Forged storyline. Mm -hmm. And there was some thought of pulling Doomsday into it. And uh, we had a couple of different writers who were you know, throwing some different ideas around. And one of them was, well, Doomsday does this and because he has intent and blah, blah, blah. And um, you know, ultimately one of the things I explained is, look, one of the reasons that Doomsday was a monster that functioned almost, we, we kept talking him like a um, something out of nature, like a, a hurricane or a tornado or, or something with no reason necessarily uh, behind what he was doing, no true motivation, was that he was supposed to be the opposite of Superman. Superman is a creature of reason. Superman is the one hero I think who's out there that if he flies down in front of a villain, uh, provided you know the villain is about to kill someone, he might say, let's talk about this. And then if the villain won't, then he takes them apart, right? It's like Superman tries to be that creature of reason. Doomsday was supposed to be beyond reason. And, and so I think that's when you have Doomsday in a story, that's sort of what you have to lean into. Um, if you want reason in it, you probably have to have someone manipulating Doomsday somehow. But I think that's what you have to lean into. And the other thing that drives me nuts is we designed him with the shoulder bones that come out sort of parallel to the ground, perpendicular to his figure. Now they've got the spiky things that grow straight up. I hate that. I will never draw that. 
so there. <laughs> no, I, 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 I agree with you. Uh, I just, you know, they, they keep uh, bringing them back uh, for certain storylines, but you know, it, it's kind of like the Joker as pertains to, to Batman. He's only, you know, that, you know, he's only as, uh, heavy, if you will, if you only use him sparingly, and they, I think yes. they kind, of, they got into a bit of a, of a, of a, um, uh, a cycle of you know bringing him back, and you know, if he was the guy that killed Superman, then he really should be only used sparingly, and if so, then I mean, it, you know, it he doesn't carry the weight that he once did. I mean, obviously in Death of that was fantastic, and then. And, hunter prey that was just so awesome um and those were just fantastic you know uh portrayals of the character and then when you start bringing them back for like joker's wild or whatever you know like the i forget the the actual name of the storyline but it didn't really do the character justice in my opinion and i was just curious coming from the man that was pivotal in creating him what you well, thought about this. yeah and and i think i think you're 100 percent right but I also think that goes to a lot of villains in comics. And oh, yeah. Yeah. it always at, it is that delicate balance of we see a story with a villain that is just so cool. We really want to see it again. Uh, the example I always use is Galactus. So to me, Galactus, if he is the supreme being that he is, you know, does he even bother to talk to humans? No. I mean, to me, the coolest thing would be if, if I could form the Marvel Universe any way I want it. We would have seen Galactus in his first appearance. And in all the years since, he might have only shown up again twice. I mean, how cool would that be? And But then you could also extend that to a lot of villains. And um, unfortunately, that's not the reality of our business. So right. yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I think that extends to a lot of uh, villains in particular, but that's not the reality of the world. So you know, you, we roll with it as best we can. Right. Uh, the um, the other character that was, you know, a part of Death of Superman that was just fantastic was Cyborg Superman. And he's another one that, um, you know, I, I will say that his reemergence through various storylines uh, has been... I, has been really good mm -hmm. <laughs> in the sense that, you know, it, it does the character and his storyline justice. Um, specifically, I'm thinking of his inclusion of in the whole Green Lantern core wars and, right, you know, right. Blackest Night, et cetera. And, you know, a part of the Sinestro core. I mean, it kind of made sense. Um, what are your thoughts on his, you know, evolution over, you know, recent years? Yeah, and, and uh, obviously, you know, we've just seen him in the new Destro book as well. And, yeah. and, and here again, he's a different character. Uh, I think there is some allowance for that because I do think he stretches a little bit better. And I thought uh, when Jeff used him in the Green Lantern stuff, I thought that was really inspired. I thought it was a yeah. great way to do that because I think really good villains can move away from the hero that they are usually tangled with and then move on into that next realm. And that's a lot of fun to see. And I thought Jeff was just awesome with what he did there. Uh, I know that I, I actually think there's enough elasticity there that, for example, at one point I said to DC, let's just do a cyborg Superman series. He's off in space. Only instead of we have Superman saving worlds, this is the story of Superman conquering. And he takes over this world and that world. And it is the malevolent Superman almost to the point. So then he takes over another planet who then inspires, you know, they don't know the difference between real Superman, cyborg Superman. So it inspires someone to say, I'm going to go back to that earth and find that Superman. And that way you create a whole new villain for the real Superman because he didn't know the difference, right? I mean, th there are some villains that I think are wide ranging enough to do those things with. And I think he would be one. Um, and it's, uh, they should have said, yes, let's do that. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's yeah. really, I mean, he's a fantastic character really yeah. is. I mean, tragic, you feel for him at times, uh, certainly in that the last panel of his, um, involvement in Sinestro, I think it was Sinestro Corp, where he's like, look, I just want to die. Yeah. And, um, 
the monitor is like, yeah, I'll, I'll kill you when this is done. You think he's dead. And then it's like his head and torso just kind of floating there. And he like comes back on and he, he cries, <laughs> you know, he's yeah. like, Oh, I didn't die. <laughs> it was, it yeah. was really heartbreaking in that sense. And uh, yeah, I thought that was great. And I know um, when I last used him uh, was when I was writing action comics for the rebirth stuff and where all Superman can do is kind of like put him in the fortress in a room where he's living this illusory life because that's it. I mean, there's no other place for him. There's nothing you can do with him. And that becomes the tragedy of cyborg Superman. I'm the, only way, the only way he can tolerate life is with a false life that is sort of beamed into his head, false notions. When you're doing death of Superman and it's a, the series that it's not just comic fans, but it's almost all eyes of the world are sort of on this. Are you feeling pressure writing that and, and working on this? And if so, how are you handling the pressure? Well, doing uh, Superman 75, by that point, we were starting to get an inkling, just an inkling that the, this might go kind of big. And, and so um, the pressure I felt at that time was just knowing that a lot of people were going to be a lot more people than usual were going to be looking at it. Um, and, you know, you want to do a good job. And the other part of the pressure was, you know, when we sat there and planned it out, we say, okay, we, we start with an issue of uh, Adventures of Superman that has four panels. And then Action Comics goes down to three panels a page. Man of Steel is two. And Superman 75 is all splash pages. It's like, yeah, that's great. Until you realize that you have really in that book, 30 panels to tell the story. And as much as it would have been fun to do every single page, uh, Superman fighting Doomsday, the reality was that at times you had to show the Cadmus guys up in a helicopter or whatever and cut away from the action to be able to get enough of the story in that people would be satisfied to a certain degree and then build it up until we had a double page spread that then became a three page spread. Mm -hmm. So the, the pressure was to try and, and do something that people would enjoy because, you know, you don't want to have a bunch of people buy a book and go, well, that sucked. <laughs> uh, but that where the pressure really got turned on is once all of that stuff became so big and Superman 75 sold the numbers it did and everything. And, you know, we had talked earlier about how, you know, Superman 77 was the last issue. And then there were no Superman comics for a while. That when we then got together to figure out how we were going to bring them back, um, that was hard because we hadn't, we, when we decided to kill Superman, we never decided how he would come back or even exactly when he would come back. We just knew, yeah, we'll get to it and we'll, we'll do that at some point because we'll have to. But when we finally got in a room to start to plan it, our editor at the time, Mike Carlin, said almost exactly what you did, which was, the whole world is watching. This has to be good, really good. And, you know, then we went back and forth on different possible solutions. And during this time, you also worked on a book, and we spoke to Brett Breeding about this, and it's a book that I recommend to any people I can who will listen to me, uh, Metal Men. And I thought that I loved that series so much. And I was wondering, did you request to be able to do that at the time, or was that assigned to you? N not really either one. It, it was more like, it, and this is the way I work. Um, you know, you, you start to have conversations with people. Would this be fun to do? Yeah, this would be fun to do. Hey, we should do this. We should do that. And all of a sudden, you're doing Metal Man. Uh, I, I never really took assignments so much. Um, you know, e even today, uh, I was speaking to someone about a potential project that I would write. And it was just, you know, I, I start by talking over ideas and, and general concepts. Do you as a publisher want, do, want to do what I want to do as a writer? Just is, is there some common ground there? Um, I, I think the, the concept of the way some things are pitched in comics and uh, publishers ask for pitches, mm -hmm. I think is uh, borderline. Well, I think it's unfair and wrong. That, that I, so what I always do is let's see if we have common ground and then we'll talk about it. And if it works out great. And so with metal men, 
it was uh, talking with Carlin, who was going to be writing it, talking with Andy Helfer, who I uh, who was editing it. And gee, can we do this? Yeah, this would be fun. And, you know, pretty soon, if you agree as editor, writer and artist, you have a book. And that's how that happened. Did you enjoy working on that series? I did. And it's too bad that Brett couldn't ink the whole thing. Uh, he did the first issue, you know, and then all of a sudden he had to step aside and uh, Jose Marzan came in. But yeah, it, it was fun. I mean, the, the fun thing about the metal men is the expressiveness that you can bring to their characters and, and visually that if, if you've been drawing like a very, um, a, a book like Superman, which is a lot of normally featured people to then be able to draw a book where if Mercury is shocked, his jaw might drop and actually hit the floor. I mean, that, that's what's fun about metal men. Right. And, and that sense of playfulness and humor. I say it, it sort of felt must have felt like a bit of a release to be able to expand a little more. You'd have to be yeah. within that world. You could do as much as you liked. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. And artistically, you know, you and, and, and Brett Breeding worked on so many things together and it seemed to work so well. Art, when you have someone, an anchor like that, who you know you can trust, how important was that for you as an artist? That's always tremendously important. And then the, as an aspect of trust mm -hmm. is having a vision in your eye for what it's going to look like when it's done. And, and um, I think that whether I was working with Brett or Norm Ratman or Kevin Nolan or Bob Layton, who was doing uh, Iron Man on me or George Perez, who did Titans and Green Arrow on me. I mean, you go down the list. I, I've been able to work with some marvelous people. What helps is that when I'm breaking it down and, and laying it out and then, you know, doing the pencils, is that I get a feel in my head and in my eye for what it's going to look like when it's inked. And so that way, when I know Brett is inking, um, I could kind of tailor some things a little bit that way to his strengths. And I do that with anybody that I work with. It's a, it's a great sense to be able to have that as while you're working, to, to know that it's going to look good because you can set some things up that they excel at so they can then drive it home. That's very interesting that, you know, it, that, that you do that to make sure that, you know, people succeed on both ends, that your drawing succeeds and their inking succeeds to that it works together so well. And it's also incredible that you mentioned, I mean, Bob Leighton and George Perez inking your stuff. That had to be, you know, as a comic fan, an absolute thrill. Oh, yeah, it, it was. I mean, uh, part of the fun of working in this business is that the the collaborations that I've been privileged to do really have been, I, I look back on them and they've been fun. I mean, I got to draw something that Stan Lee wrote. I've been able to write um, for Kurt Swan and Gil Kane and John Buscema and, and have them draw something I wrote, which is an incredible thrill. Uh, we have the inkers we just talked about. I would also add, you know, like Dick Giordano to the list. Uh, I got to be inked by Murphy Anderson and John Romita Sr. and uh, so many others that, you know, Terry Austin and people I'm probably not remembering. I mean, uh, John Byrne inked a Superman cover. Walter Simonson inked a couple of covers. And so to be able to collaborate with these people has been really remarkable. And it's one of the things I um, enjoy most about having been in comics that if I get to write down uh, a list of the people I've been fortunate enough to work with, it's a lot of the old masters who came before me. And I think a lot of young guys are gonna be the old masters long after I'm gone. So that's that's a great part of comics. And just one quick thing, do you consider, looking back now at your career, you are one of the, or you're one of the masters. I mean, for so many people, does that ever hit you? Like, you know, I'm Dan Jurgens. like I'm people, you know, love my stuff. And, you know, you've influenced so many folks. It's, or, and it's weird because I can, I can conceptualize that, but it's, uh, it's a hard thing to grasp. And, and, you know, I know it's there because of, of the lines you get when people bring their books to you to get signed. And, and some people, you know, really have some wonderful things to say about the work they might've read of mine at a, you know, in their youth or their younger days or whatever. So yeah, it's like, I'm aware of it. Um, 
and it's very flattering. And I kind of know what they mean because I feel that way about so many other creators, right? And, and so to, to be able to contribute on that level and, and for as long as I have, yeah, it does mean a lot to me. And it's, it's because in a way as a creator, you know you've done well when you've made people feel the way that you felt when you were 10, 12, 20, even, I mean, whatever, that if as a creator, you can reach out and kind of have impact on someone. Yeah, that's very meaningful. I, I have to echo what Orin is saying, because you were the first um, comic book uh, writer, creator um, that I that I learned. So when I first got into comics, you know, like, you know, you know who Stanley was, you know, who oh, Jack sure. Kirby was. Uh, just because you you heard the names and you know that just you know by osmosis you just kind of learned it um, but as a new comic book collector and, and reader yours was the first that I learned and knew who you know knew your your work mm -hmm. um, and you know I, it was you know ever since then when I when people say okay well when you picture Superman what do you, you know, whose version do you think of? Or so I, there's, you know, in terms of movies, Christopher Reeve, but as it pertains to comics, it's yours and John Byrne. And it's everything else afterwards is great. Not knocking anyone's work because, you know, everyone is, you know, they have, they bring their own style to whatever it is they're doing, but yours is just iconic and, I mean, it will forever. I mean, it, that's my measuring stick uh, for like any other version that comes afterwards. Well, thank uh, you. I, I I appreciate that very much. And um, I I was sort of that way myself. Uh, I had had not been working at DC very long um, when Karen Berger called me up one day, and Karen at that time was editorial coordinator. Uh, editorial coordinator when a book was late might find someone to draw it, something like that, and she called me up and said, can you draw Superman? And my response is, and this is really true. I said, no, only Kurt Swan can draw Superman. So, you know, we all kind of have that where we associate one particular creator with one particular uh, uh, character or something like that. And I, I think when, as a, on a creative level, when you get to that point where you can say you've hit that, it's great because, you know, not a lot of people do. And one of the things I always try and tell younger guys who, especially artists, because they complain about the fact that, you know, writers are much more dominant in the industry now. I said, well, you know, do a three year run on whatever man, you know, and you'll have that, but you have to stake it out as your own. And that's a lot of people aren't doing that anymore. And it's, it's not good. You don't really have that anymore. You don't no. have, I mean, I, you know, Brian Michael Bendis was the last that I can think of that had a, a long run, if you will, certainly not as long as yours. And quite frankly, I don't, you know, for all that it was, and I'm not knocking it, but I expected more out of it. Well, um, and you know, although the, the one thing I'll jump in on real quick is that that might just be um, with because I want to get this on record because I think this was such an achievement. Bendis and uh, Bagley on uh, Ultimate Spider-Man, the, the page count they did, the number of issues they did, that run was fantastic. Um, and that, yeah, if you go over 100 issues, I mean, no one's doing that now. So No, no. Except no. on Walking Dead and, uh, well, and Eric Larson with uh, Savage Dragon. Yeah, well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, you know, in addition to uh, Death of Superman, you've been a part of so many big story arcs and crossovers. Uh, Zero Hour, uh, the one Orin has there, Armageddon 2000. Is that, is that the Armageddon one? I can't, there's yeah. a glare. Okay. And um, Panic in the Sky. Um, did you get burned out from working on all these, you know, extended series and story arcs? I mean, because that, that's a lot to juggle, I would think. It's a lot to juggle, but I like the challenge of it. And I, I think superhero comics should be about big max out storytelling, right? And, and I think um, 
there is always a place for the, the quieter character stories and things that fit within that. But to me, there's something about the nature of superhero comics that still works best when you hit a big max out uh, wide ranging story. That doesn't mean company crossover necessarily. That can be a part of it. Um, I, I know when we did last year, Generations Forge and Generation Shattered, part of that was we wanted to build something much bigger off of that. Then things got turbulent at DC, so that didn't happen. But I, I really think that we're at our best, our, our industry succeeds best when fans are talking about the story. And often those are the stories they talk about. Can you believe what's happening across these three books? Can you believe this? Can you believe that? And when, when we're just talking about this character being this or that, and we're not talking about the story, then I think we're missing something as from a creative standpoint, we're, we are not doing our jobs as well as we could be. And so I find that challenging. I find it fun. I think that is something that superhero universes work really well with. So if, if you reference, say, Panic in the Sky, where I just said, you know, why do we always, why do heroes always wait for the alien invasion to come to Earth and beat back the, the alien invaders after half the cities are wiped out and millions of people are dead? What if they go out in space and head it off at the, at the point of attack? And so you know, you can build big stories off stuff like that. Simple comments, simple theories. And I think that's what gets people excited. Do you think that maybe there are uh, too many reboots? Uh, yes. Or, I, I mean, I, I, mean I, I hear what you're saying. And I agree with you. I mean, that's what comics are. They're supposed to be big and fun. But, you know, conversely, if every few months there's a crisis or a rebirth or reboot i mean and that each event becomes less and less you know pivotal i mean crisis on infinite earths was what it was because it didn't you know nothing like that had happened mm -hmm. previously um and you know the same holds true with marvel you know the various um you know they don't really I, i'm not I, I can't keep up with Marvel as much as I can DC, unfortunately. But, you know, like with the various reboots that they do with the X-Men, uh, it's, you know, it's hard to keep track. And it, it, it's not as, you know, it, it's if every time, every big event is just, you know, a, a um, you know, a preparation for the next big event, then really, then they're, they, they don't carry any weight. Right. Yeah. And um you know, I, I agree with that. At the same time, I will be the, the first one to say the market has changed. So from uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths to Zero Hour was, say, 10 years. And, and I think you can have a reset of sorts every 10 years. Well, that kind of, kind of shortened up a little bit. And so then it became sort of, I think, five years and, and now might even be more common than that. Um, I think what that shows is a lack of creativity on our part uh, as writers, because what you're also supposed to have, I think, mixed in with this is this idea of uh, more new characters populating these universes. And I mean, when I say new characters, I don't mean the 17th uh, derivative version of, you know, whatever, you know, Skyboy. You know, you know it's, it's, I mean, truly new things and certainly with the, with the Marvel universe that I loved as a kid, you know, oh, here's Howard the Duck, that's kind of different. And, you know, here's Adam Warlock, that's kind of different. And, and so you had these new things that came in and worked, never mind all the new characters in X-Men, whether it's Nightcrawler, Storm, Wolverine, whatever, but that then became cornerstones of their own universes and ultimately other media. And um, I think that's also a place where we've been weak for years now that those um, new concepts in a lot of ways aren't getting introduced into these universes to help populate them. And instead what it is, oh, here's another person that's Robin kind of thing. And that's, you know, and, and I think fans get less interested in the 15th Robin that they've seen this month, that they want to move beyond that and see something 
a new character that might interact in their bat universe or something, whatever universe they're they're reading, but but it's a little more fresh than that. I, I want to be cognizant of your time, but I just have one quick question is that, you know, when you jumped in and you, I would say jump, but when you started working for Marvel um, and you had such a legacy of DC, did you feel that you had to change your style or approach at all to, um, with their style of writing or their style of art, or were you comfortable with what you had been doing? Um, it depends on the, on the project. So for example, when I went to Marvel in uh, 1995 to do Spider-Man, I had drawn, I think a cover in like two pages. Then a package showed up, uh, FedEx came, here's a package from John Romita Sr. And, and John said, your Spider-Man is a little too muscular. Well, not a surprise because I was coming off Superman, right? <laughs> and so I, I looked at this, oh my God, he's right. This, my Spidey was too bulky. So I went back and fixed it. And even now when I look back on it, I say, damn, that was a thick Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I should have changed a little more. Had I been drawing Thor, uh, probably would have pulled, pulled it off okay. So I think it depends a little bit on the project. I think what's most important is to make sure no matter where the project is, no matter who the publisher is, that you're doing what's right for the character or the project that you're writing and, or drawing. So if, if I'm drawing a particular book at uh, DC versus Marvel, versus a claim when I went there, whatever it might be, to try and treat those individual characters with enough respect that you're portraying them through word or drawing as they should be portrayed. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because we, we've spoken to some other people and I think Mark Wade said it where it's playing with other people's toys that yes. you play with them for a bit, but you don't want to mess them up. You play with it for a bit and then you put it back on the shelf for someone else. And so then they can do it, but you don't, you know, change everything about it. So when people get it, it's, it's a whole different toy to play with. Right. The, the, and Mark is 100% right. Uh, the one thing I say is not only do you not break it, but when you put it back on the shelf, that toy has a new thing to go with it that, you know, so if you think of it like Batman's utility belt, Batman has a new weapon or he's got a new Batmobile or something that, because I think the other part of the gig is that when you leave a book, ideally it's better off than when you got there. You leave it in a better place and you have contributed something to the tapestry of that character that someone else will want to use. And I, I think, for example, during my time on Superman, whether it was my first run in 80s and 90s or even um, more recently through the rebirth stuff and everything else, I think in both cases, I have uh, left it in better shape than I might have, it might have been in when I got there, which is not to say it was bad when I got there, but that you contribute to the legacy of these characters. I think that's another part of the gig. I would say you, you certainly have done that. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I, I uh, my last comment is there is a line that Batman says in um, Infinite Crisis, and it's the last time it's when uh, Batman, Superman and Wonder Woman are having their argument before the whole series kind of takes off. And it's, you know, Batman turns to Clark and basically says, the last time you inspired anyone was when you were dead. And I was it, it just I was like, wow, first of all, Batman's being a dick, but that's OK. Yep. But it was so true because I see that as, you know, that was the last time that the Superman character really was just a draw an inspiration um just just lived up to superman and i i mean that was you know i i attribute that to the work you and the rest of your team did because it was some of the best stuff and i don't mean to make this all about superman because i know you have done so much stuff but that's how important the character in your work is to me and I know you, okay. you've you've heard that a lot over the years, and I understand that, but yeah. it really is. So when Oren said that we, we were going to talk to you, I was like, <laughs> kid in a candy store. Well, I, I appreciate that. And yeah, that comment of Batman's, believe it or not, um, I, I had people in DC's offices say that to me, like, 
many times. And, and so yeah. that was a thing that had gone through DC. Now, I don't know if the people in the office necessarily picked it up from Infinite Crisis or whether it was something that a couple of choice folks in the office said. I know what I think, <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> for sure. um, but I, 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 I get that. I, I think, you know, a lot of people wrestle with Superman and, and how to write Superman. And I, I think there's plenty of ways for him to be inspirational. Part of it was when we made the decision to have Clark and Lois have a son um, and, and to bring John into the world, part of it was to give him that opportunity and inspiration by being the good dad, because let's face it, Batman was the bad dad. Mm -hmm. And I know he supposedly didn't know about Damien, but I mean, come on, world's greatest detective, come on. Uh, so, you know, um, more he knew that about was, that, but come that on. was our counterpoint to Batman. Right. I mean, right. so, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, your work has been just home run every time. Thank you. So, um, before we go though, where can people, you mentioned your website, but where can people follow you, see your work? Uh, uh, okay, all the, so all the good sure. stuff. Um, uh, you can see my stuff on danjurgens.com. On Twitter, I am the Dan Jurgens. You can follow me there. That's a little more timely in terms of uh, finding out the current projects. These days, I am writing uh, Blue and Gold at DC with yes. wonderful art by Ryan Sook. It's just fantastic. Yeah. Although in issue four, I, I'm really happy with issue four, which is our next one out, because it has a, a, a fun little couple of flashbacks. And it's set up so that we see an incident from the past as seen by Blue Beetle and also by Booster. And wonder of wonders, they don't quite coincide. Uh, Kevin McGuire drew the Blue Beetle portion. I drew the Booster portion. And then we bring Ryan in to draw the here's what really happened. Uh, kind of portion. So I think it's a fun story that, <clears throat> excuse me, fits Beetle and Booster really, really well. Uh, right now, um, I had just recently gotten done drawing an issue of X-Men Legends that I think is out next month. Uh, and also Brett and I are doing a variety of covers for Marvel these days. Uh, That's right. Yes, you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. We have... Um, I've got a Wolverine cover on my board right now that has to be finished in time for Brett to ink it tomorrow. So, uh, but uh, we have that and um, a couple of sneaky things coming up for next year that we can't announce yet. Okay. Well, we won't hold you up from your work. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your, your day and your schedule to talk to us. It, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor. Yes, oh, thank you very much. It was great to be here. You guys are fantastic. Thank, thank you so very much. much. And especially if you're going to go so deep that you have Armageddon 2001. Man, <laughs> I was looking for I was looking for Metal Man and I was like, oh, because I know everyone always brings out uh, Superman for you. So I, you know, try to impress. Well, you know what? And that that was so much fun to work on. I mean, and, and this gets back to the collaborations we talked mm -hmm. about to be able to work uh with Archie Goodwin and Denny O'Neill who wrote that and and draw for them I mean that was an honor so yeah it's great to see oh yeah those the big names right there I mean the three of you and, and Dick Giordano too I think he did the uh, yes yeah uh, Dick inked that and the the cover right there was inked by Terry Austin so yeah, yeah that was you talk about a home run for me on a personal level to be able to work with those guys that was a home run all the way around. hey so that was our interview with Dan Jurgens. Uh, I gotta tell you I was I was very nervous talking to him. Uh, he seems like a very, very serious guy. And, you know, to an extent he is. But he is absolutely extraordinarily honest, you know, uh, discussing to him uh, my my thoughts on, you know, the monster doomsday, who I think, you know, when it came out was extraordinarily, uh, you know, groundbreaking for the time. Uh, but nowadays, the character is a bit watered down and he actually you know agreed with me so um i was uh, pleasantly surprised yeah i've been waiting many 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 years to ask him questions about uh, metal men miniseries and i got the opportunity to do that so i'm a, i'm a very happy camper yeah great interview folks um sorry i couldn't make it uh it was really to my detriment um sounds like a great guy very insightful on his work 
Um, listen, folks, you know, this is the Wednesday after we received some uh, very harrowing news in the comic book world. So we just wanted to acknowledge that uh, George Perez's announcement that, uh, you know, he has terminal cancer. Um, you know, we'll, we'll do more of an appropriate sort of homage to him or honoring of him uh, at a later point. But uh, he was a big part of our um, our comic book life and the work um, that he's done really stands the test of time. So, you know, we wish him and his family the best during this tough time. Uh, but that'll do it uh, for this episode of the Dollar Bin Bandits. Uh, we have another and another and another coming up for our Superman, our season of Superman month. Uh, but uh, you know where to find us on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter. Uh, please rate, review, and subscribe. And we will see you next time. Peace.